Welcome back. So uh, tonight we're going to be looking at an end game that was just played in the Chess Pro League. Um, Mannered Monkey just covered this um, on Spinal Tap's stream. Uh, so that Spinal Tap being international master Tom Bartell. Um, Mannered Monkey being at least a chess expert as far as I recall. Uh, very passionate and um, really eloquent or Maybe if he struggles with his words occasionally, that's fine, but he's very precise about his speaking and making sure that you understand him. Uh, so a group of us were just watching um, some games that were played in the Chess Pro League. If you want to learn more about that, go over to Spinal Tap's um, stream or channel. Um, but what caught my eye was this particular endgame, which... Uh, certainly confused Mannered Monkey, confused me, confused probably most of the audience who's below Master. Um, I just happened to have read the Encyclopedia of Chess Endgames, so I know a thing or two that other chess players may or may not necessarily know. Um, so that said, uh, I didn't actually catch the rest of the game. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of a surprise how we got there. Uh, we got a semi-slav where, um, well, I don't know this theory very well, if at all. I do know similar positions where white's queen ends up not on c1, but on b3, and then white plays c5, and black often has to retreat the queen. However, I guess on account of this bishop being on g3, that's not really an option for black. Um, black prophylactically retreats anyway, which is okay. Um, so, I again don't know very much about this particular opening, so we're going to go past this phase of the game as much as I'm tempted to comment upon it. Um, and again, I've seen some expert and master games in this opening, um, but I am not qualified to speak on the middle game strategy here, and I'm sure there are multiple goals that each player has in mind. Um, so what's interesting so far is that White's achieved um, this unprotected passed pawn. Um, actually, Sergei Ehrenberg was playing Black, so let's view this from um, Black's point of view. Um, uh, because Sergei was playing along with our comrade, um, Spinal Tapper Tom Bartell, uh, with the Philadelphia team. So, this is an interesting position for sure. Um, various audience members had their opinions about do you prefer the white pieces, do you prefer the black pieces here. Um, so, my take on this, and again, I'm not an expert in this opening, I don't know this very well, but it seems like white has a space advantage, and that if white can preserve the bishop versus knight, um, that somehow maybe white's king can find some safe haven, and white can pawn storm on the king side as well as the queen side, and then somehow make some incredible breakthrough. Much, much easier said than done, but I slightly prefer white. Um, for a couple reasons, um, even though, well, th this feels like an open position to me. Yes, uh, black can blockade the e pawn on uh, just putting a piece on e6, or might not even need to do that. Uh, yes, that knight can jump a great many places, but I really like white's bishop. Um, it has great flexibility compared to white's pawns. It, it, there aren't going to be very many collisions. Um, so my anticipation is that white can reorganize his pieces and somehow, I don't know how, but break through somehow, somewhere, some when. Um, but it's a close game, for sure. At least in my opinion. Again, I don't know this setup very well. So it caught me quite by surprise that white just kept leaving this bishop on f3. Um, maybe it's best if we just move into the end game phase. Um, so white had to play pawn takes here, otherwise um, 
too many pieces get liquidated and the end game's too favorable after say rook takes f3 uh if white's going to attempt to hold the material i mean black could take the e-file um uh, white does have the option to liquidate here, but it's really unwise. On the other hand, black has a protected past pawn, so pieces are eventually going to liquidate anyway, uh, with black controlling the tempo of the game. So exchanging on e5 even here is kind of unwise for white, to put it mildly. Um, but... Um, I mean, the other thing I was looking at before going into this would be black just takes the e-file by force. Uh, one thing to note, Leechus did just italicize these sub-variations. Uh, so they, even now they're putting more work into making Leechus look nicer and be a little bit more accessible or easy to use uh, or to understand. So kudos to them. Um, so yeah, knight takes f3, um, white was going for this, and white really wants to play f4 protecting this pawn, and ideally uh, f5 and uh, e6, getting a protected passed pawn of his own. That's kind of a pipe dream. Um, I'm not sure what drove white to play in this manner. Um, I don't get it. Uh, I suppose I don't need the circle there. But, yeah. Um, so, let's... So white does have some ambitions here. Um, white does have... White retains the space advantage. But without minor pieces on the board, that space advantage isn't as important anymore. And the doubled pawns and fractured king shelter. Um, it's, I don't know. White's well, playing optimistically. I suppose it's worth mentioning that the time control for this was pretty rapid. I, I don't know exactly what it was. I think it was 15 plus 2 or something. It was, it's really fast. So snap judgments are made. Um, and by no means do we ever expect a game of the century to appear under such conditions. So if a master makes a move and then later we just come back and say, oh yeah, that's completely bunk. You just made an impulse judgment and it doesn't work at all. That's acceptable under this um, condition as opposed to saying um, that in a much slower time control, the master thought about this position quite a bit and just completely flubbed it for whatever reason, which is really uncommon. Much more common would be that Master is seeing something and he just underestimated or overestimated something. Anyway, let's get to the end game. I keep saying that and we're going to get there. So, again, um, well, I guess here White's grabbing a pawn. Uh, it's kind of forced. I mean, yeah, the e5 pawn's not going anywhere, but if you don't take it, um, you're never going to get it. Um, and there's no way for white to make his pieces more mobile before taking the pawn. Uh, I guess he could try f4. He could try uh, f4, e3, f3, uh, but there's no reason to go for this, and it does, in fact, hang the pawn. So, um, see so yeah. ya. Pawn, rook takes e5, does gain the pawn, or regain it. Um, how did this go? So, yeah, this prepares white to take on f6. I guess that's what he was thinking. Uh, maybe he just miscalculated. I, I have no idea. Um, or just didn't appreciate this endgame. But I prefer this for black. Not saying it's winning for black, but man, this is challenging for white. Um, there are just so many targets, so much looseness in white's position. Um, so yeah, white does still have a space advantage, but it's looking pretty bleak. Um, interesting thought would be, what if white does queen takes e5 instead of rook takes e5? 
So what if we go here? I have not looked at this. Um, I'm not sure that I even have time to get into the ramifications of this if this had happened instead. Um, this could be another interesting endgame all in itself. Um, do I experience the machine learning um, informally? Uh, I did academically do, uh, do some study of it, but in terms of actual projects with machine learning, all of that has been formal rather than or informal rather than research oriented. I understand the concepts, but I do not have practice in that field. Um, so yeah, I don't know after queen takes e5. That, I mean, that's a different endgame. Um, uh, this one is still quite complex. Um, and there's tons of room, especially at this insanely fast time control, for either player to um, make catastrophic errors. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this phase of the game. Um, understandably, both players are interested in liquidating a little bit, and now we get something that humans are having some chance of calculating at this time control. Um, though I wouldn't bet on it. Um, I suppose it's worth noting that uh, if the queens exchange, black is always winning barring some miracle by white where the protected pass pawn on d5 um, doesn't end up deciding the game but uh, that would kind of require a miracle in the form of the queenside pawns liquidating so that it's no longer a protected pass pawn but just a passed pawn um, but white would have to liquidate the pawn on c6 for that to go and for c6 to go, b7 would have to go. And I mean, this is really asking a lot of white's position. So maybe from a practical standpoint, it's easier to calculate the positions after rook takes rook. Maybe white's king is safer after rook takes rook. Um, but that end game, once you've exchanged the rooks, uh, only black can win it. Um, and maybe that's true before the rook exchange as well, but with more pieces on the board, it's a little bit uh, trickier. Just my opinion. Um, so yeah, white's trying to hold onto the pawns to free the queen to move. Uh, black says none of that. Um, and black's just gradually um, moving pieces toward the center, preparing to advance the d-pawn, and then supposing the queen's trade and the d pawn liquidates. Um, supposing all these pieces are traded, uh, if this king is located on a good enough square, maybe, just maybe, it could end up taking this pawn uh, or the c5 pawn under some circumstances. So uh, black is trying to either get the d pawn to promote or to achieve a one king and pawn endgame. Um, where the queen side collapses before white has time to um, advance on the king side. So uh, there's going to be a lot of haggling going on, with just a lot of negotiation. Um, understandably, white wants to liquidate these pawns. Um, I don't have time to calculate everything, but... Um, this was kind of a do or die moment for white, so if white just commits to passive defense, maybe there's a fortress here somewhere relying on some kind of perpetual check. Maybe somehow white's not losing this, um, but realistically a human would prefer to just exchange as many pawns as possible uh, and be able to measure whether or not um, the remaining pawns can be uh, removed by the kings and a draw agreed. Um, so yeah, white's doing the thematic thing here that usually works out, um, but white's down a pawn, so that's kind of a big problem. 
another critical moment in the game. I mean, I don't think b6 is any good, especially because of queen takes c5. Um, so, yeah, I guess b6 isn't worth too much looking at. Um, maybe there's some way in some variation white could have, like, I don't know, landed the queen onto c4 and then had time to play b6. And uh, we'll leave that as an exercise for the extremely devoted human uh, endgame zealot or for the engines. Because um, at this time control, anything can happen. Um, so. Going forward, white exchanges those pawns. Now, if only white can exchange these, maybe there's some potential for a fortress. Really unlikely, but maybe. Um, this fortress potential would be far more likely, say, if this pawn were moved over to g3, and then white's king could just hang out on e1. Um, that would make it very difficult for black to penetrate, However, white having doubled pawns and two pawn islands and black having a passed pawn is making a lot of complications for white here. Um, it's not to say that black's task is easy, but um, black has lots of chances here. Uh, so during the game, I commented, well, gosh, if I were black, I'd probably do something like this. You just check, get the king to not be able to move to f3, so you check it back, and then just snap c5. Um, presumably the masters looked at this and I don't know what they thought, but uh, queen d7 is more than sufficient here because um, black's threatening to run the d-pawn and then to run the king here. And what's white going to do? Um, white did opt to check. If I were white, I would play queen d3 here. Um, force black to try to find something, although I guess, um, whoops, not there. Definitely not there. How do I delete a move? Nope, that's not deleting a move. Uh, delete from here. We're going to move queen d5. Um, I guess white doesn't have much checking potential from here. So I guess that's why white went for queen a8. And, um, so because of this variation, uh, I'm going to award this in... Uh, let's see, how do I annotate this move? Annotate with symbols. We're going to say good move. Very good move. Um, saved. Cool. So yeah, this queen d7 um, really reduces white's uh, counterplay to just this move. Because if you look at what happened in the game, um, this was white's only opportunity to stop the pawn. And even this endgame is pretty tragic. Um, I suppose back here, um, yeah, this doesn't work so well because, well, so many reasons. Um, maybe this is the best way to proceed. I don't know. I think it's the one that would psych me out the most as white because uh, black's just one turn away from promoting and all black's pawns are defended. Um, but in terms of actually finding a winning move, it's not so simple. Um, but you know, back here, black doesn't even have to go over that. Um, yeah, I guess maybe just queen... Yeah, let me get rid of this annotation. Don't need that there. Queen e7 check, um, queen here, queen here, um, I suppose you don't want to be in line with the promotion square, um, gosh, 
This is way more complicated than I thought. But, um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, let's make, no, no, no. Uh, whatever. I accidentally promoted that. Let's promote this because that's what actually happened. Um, yeah, apparently I can't promote one sub variation. Um, so let's just delete the moves after this. Um, yeah, so this refutes my queen d3 notion. Uh, king f1 d3. So, oh right, so saying king e1. Just play this way. And this feels very comfortable for black, but I'm not sure that there's a win here. I mean, the entire white position is hanging, but uh, in terms of actually finding constructive moves, it's not so simple. So that might have been how I attempted to do this, um, because these queen checks tend to always run out. You think you have something, and then uh, see black as alternating color squares, so... Um, now the queen can't move. Well, I guess it could. Um, usually if you're alternating square colors, that makes it uh, trickier for diagonal checks to work. Um, because if you're checked diagonally, uh, if you move vertically or horizontally, you can't, um, your opponent can't make a diagonal move to check you. So if black is alternating dark, light, dark, light in terms of squares, um, generally your opponent's queen is also going to move dark, light to dark, to light to check you. Uh, it's a nice little uh, time-saving trick that can help you in some very specific situations. Um, so you see, like, here you went from dark to light to dark, um, and this means that this queen, which gave a diagonal check, can't move diagonally to check again. It has to move vertically or horizontally. Um, and all the vertical and horizontal checks are covered. I mean, it could move right next to the king, but that's pretty silly. Um, so, white does the next best thing and pins the pawn. Uh, black prepares to capture on c5 and white tries to check from behind. So, yeah, I'm not sure if um, queen d5 was the best way to approach this, but I think at this point, um, well, I did look at the stockfish evaluation before this analysis, but, um, I mean, just optically, this is extremely difficult for white to even try to hold at this point. Um, white has only three blocking squares remaining White's king remains nowhere near that. Um, it would take White a few turns to just get in the way using the king. White would prefer not to put the queen on one of these squares, especially since the queen prefers to be in the center four as opposed to, you know, on the first three ranks. Um, the further back you are, the less checking options there are that can get you back to where you came from. Um, so yeah, I think at this point it's safe to say that no human player under 15 to uh, time control could ever save this um, against perfect play. And it may very well be that this is a win. It might, well, let's, uh, let's put on the engine evaluation against my better judgment. Um, minus two means that it doesn't see the forced win uh, I just remembered I can't leave that running too long or my stream will hang or freeze. Um, but minus two means that um, the forcing wind variation is not yet found. But this seriously is much better for black than it is for white. So I would say it's on the cusp of um, white losing this. And indeed, in the game, uh, Black did win this. 
Um, I mean, we could look through all the variations at this point to see, as an engine could, is there any way for white to hold this? There might be. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, the moment is past. Um, there's no saving it at this point, um, at least in time pressure. Uh, it's just a hopeless mess. So yeah, that's my coverage of this Ehrenberg uh, endgame. I enjoyed it. Uh, I know I did skip through the opening, I did skip through the middle game, and I skipped the late end game where you could run that with your engine at home and see like, oh, I found some reason that the value should be should be minus 1.9 instead of minus 2, or it should be minus 2.1, or if it's mate in 35, and I feel smart for having found that. And I guess more power to you for doing that. Um, leaving that as an exercise to the student, and I'm not feeling like going into all those details. I want to just hit the high points of this end game, just strategically what's going on here. Um, and um, I'm not sure that both masters understood, or maybe they did, and they just felt that this is the best way to go anyhow, but I, um, what I'd like to see one day is masters just playing these end games cold, just like from heart, they know exactly how to react in these kinds of really challenging situations. And it seems like Ehrenberg played it very well. Um, so yeah, he centralized his queen, brought his king forward, and white um, white gave up his pawn fortress on the queen side and just um, uh, put all his eggs in one basket here, and it wasn't good enough. Um, so yeah. Um, it's unfortunate for White, um, but yeah, it's good for Team Philadelphia. So, well done, uh, Spinal Tap and Team. Um, so, yeah, hope you enjoyed. Um, didn't have really much more to say than this, so yeah, thanks for watching, and I uh, hope to see you around.